Well, my name is William. You know, friends, family called me Jew Man. I just came home from prison doing 31 years straight. I got released from prison uh, this year on the 21st of March of this year. You know, that's a little less than 90 days ago. I'm still trying to wrap my head, you know what I mean, around the reality of me being out here, you know, because, you know, a couple of years ago, just, I'd say about two years ago, I was under the impression that I was never getting out, or at least that, you know, it would be, man, 2052 until, you know, the earliest date that I can get out. Them years that I spent in there thinking that I was never going to get out or that I was going to be an old man once I got out, <laughs> wasn't easy, man. It wasn't easy. When I first came into the system in 88, June of 1988, my parole date was 1996, February 26 of 1996. My mandatory at that time, my good time release date at that time was 2027. I lost that good time, you know, which was 20 for 30 back then. 20 for 30, that meant that for every 30 days that I do, you know, they would knock off 20. But I lost that that uh, that good time or that privilege, privilege to even receive good time by being, you know, what they call a hard head or trying to apply myself to the convict way of life in prison caused me to get in, you know, a little trouble, had a little trouble with the officers, and I lost my good time. And my good time went from 20 for 30 to zero for 30, which sent my date back from 2027 20, to 2052. The way I was carrying it, you know, back then in 1988, 89, you know, it was hard for me to get back on the right track to where I can start earning my good time again. Like I said, I had, at, during that time, I had four uncles already in prison. And hearing the stories about my uncles and how they was carrying it, you know, it intrigued me. You know what I mean? It, it got me to the point to where I, this is, that is how I wanted to be. I wanted to be like my uncles. One of my uncles, you know, I'm not gonna say his name, but he carried around the stories I heard about him. He used to carry around two, two knives, you know, in the front of his, you know, his jeans. I used to like that, hearing stories about my uncles. You know, the, all the old heads used to tell me, man, you know, your uncles this and your uncles that, man. You know, they was this and they was that, you know. And that's all I wanted to be, you know, because I was 18 coming in. Lo and behold, man, I picked up two knives, started carrying them on me, and I already had a small man complex back then. So the least little thing somebody said to me or bumped me the wrong way or whatever, I felt like I had to, you know, step up and represent the way my uncles did. It had gotten to the point to where, because I was carrying it so, so raw, back then, I'm gonna use that word raw, that my uncles didn't want to have anything else to do with me. They just stopped dealing with me because I was doing things a little different from what they, how they was doing it. They was doing things within reason, I guess. But me, this was just something about having them knives on me, man, that just made me feel invincible. You know, I felt invincible, man. And I kind of looked forward to getting into little shit, man. You know, excuse my language, but I look forward to getting into shit because I had them knives. I always wanted to know how it felt to actually stab somebody, not just walk around and carry the knives on me. Eventually, I got that opportunity <laughs> to experience how it felt to stab somebody. And I'm gonna tell you, you know, it may sound crazy, but it felt good, you know? It felt good to actually have that much power. It's sort of like these youngins out here in the street now just walking around with these guns, these pistols and things, man. You know, they feel invincible with that. 
And in there, that was our guns, the knives. I was a regular Clint Eastwood, <laughs> if you want to, you know what I mean? Yeah, because I didn't mind using them. But, you know, not to glorify that lifestyle, because living that lifestyle caused me to lose my good time, and it caused me to stay in prison a whole lot longer than I, you know, supposed to have been in there. I've lost friends. I done had a couple of them actually die behind getting stabbed, you know, in prison. You know, lose their life, man. Just like out here with the youngest carrying these guns, just committing these murders out here, you know, in the name of the little gangs that they into, it ain't no coming back from that for real. Once you take a life, it ain't no coming back from it, man. I can honestly say that nobody never died behind me stabbing nobody, but I had my share of stabbings. You know, I got into a fight or I got into an argument or whatever. Once you pull them out, you got to use them. Ain't no sense of pulling them out if you ain't gonna use them. So I actually used them. I went in the cell with guys. Guys were offering me to come in the cell. We're coming in my cell. We're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. Hey, man, you ain't had to ask me twice. I was already in there. That was my lifestyle in there. You know, at least the beginning of my bit, which I, I look back on now. And I'ma actually say, man, I was living reckless. You know, I don't glorify that. Yeah, it got, it got me, it got me the respect that I was looking for. You know, the same respect that my uncles had. I've developed a reputation on my own. Now that I look back on it, man, it's, you know, it was nothing, man. It's nothing. You know, the reputation I, I want now, being out here in society now, giving it, you know, having given this second chance. I want a reputation of somebody who's a hard worker, man, that came out here and doing right by his family. You know, friends, those who looked out for him while he was in prison. I don't want that lifestyle no more. I don't want that reputation no more. You know, I don't have anything to prove to nobody in prison. I don't have nothing to prove to nobody out here. The only person I have to prove anything to out here is myself. I want to prove to myself that I really can come out here and be successful. I was already reckless when I first went to prison, you know, because I went to prison for two counts of armed robbery, five counts of robbery. I want no angel out here. I want no angel. I was already living reckless. I was 18 and going into prison at 18, I'm going to actually say the stories that I used to hear about prison, how guys would stab each other, kill each other behind $2, a pack of cigarettes. You know, I was scared going to prison at first, you know, because I was, I was only 18. I was young. The reputation that I was seeking once I actually got to prison, I developed it basically through fear because <laughs> I, I didn't want to get up in there and somebody stab me or kill me or whatever, you know, behind the stories that I was hearing. Like I say, the, the thing that helped me, you know, develop the little reputation that I had was my uncles. Also, what helped me develop or what caused me to develop that reputation or that attitude that I had was the treatment that I received from the officers up in there. Treatment that I received from my girlfriend that I had at the time that I, you know, that I went to prison, she left me. I stopped writing me letters, and then at times, you know, where family couldn't send me money or whatever, all that played a part in me developing that reputation or that fuck it attitude or whatever, you know, that caused me to stay in prison longer than I normally would have. You know, it's a lot of little things, man, that 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 turns a man for the better or the worse, man. You know what I mean? It's a lot of things that plays a part. You having somebody to tell you uh, when and when you can't eat, when and when you can't go outside, when and when you can't wash your ass. You know, excuse my language, but you know, 
<laughs> just being honest, I got tired of that real fast, man. I couldn't really say what I wanted to say or say how I really felt during times that uh, I may have been speaking with an officer or whatever, and I'm looking at him like, man, this guy here, you know, he not too much older than I am because you had a lot of young officers in prison telling you what you can and could not do. So a lot of that kind of changed, you know, me. And it changed people all the time, man. You know, having somebody tell you what you can and can't do. Telling you, here it is, nine o'clock, you got to go to bed. You got to be locked down in your cell. It's time for you to go to bed. I got tired of that. A lot of little things, man, and then you look, the little medical situations in there. You got something seriously wrong with you, but because so many people have done things to make the medical department take us for jokes, you know what I mean, you know, during that time or whatever, they won't taking serious cases serious. And all of that just played a part in my attitude. Let me say a little bit about you know, when I first got to my first day in prison coming from receiving, you know, which was June 28th of 1988, I got to uh, Augusta Correctional Center. And when I got there, my younger brother, who was a year younger than him, he was already there. He had been there for about a good month. And like I said, I had two uncles that was already there. But the part that they put me in, I didn't know anybody. So, you know, guys was uh, kind of standoffish. You know, they ain't nobody know who I was, you know, in the pod that I was in. So I sat up in the pod at the table by myself one day. Man, I'm looking at everybody eating their little oodles and noodles or whatever they were eating, their little snacks and everything. And I ain't have anything because I was just getting there. You know, uh, my cosmetics was you know, non-existent, you know, I, I, I didn't have anything, you know, so I sat at the table by myself just watching, you know, everybody do their thing. It wasn't until the next morning that I got woke up, you know, by my brother and about five of my so-called homeboys, you know, they came into the pod and man, they had all kind of little groceries bags out there for me, snacks, food, cosmetics, some of everything. And it was then, you know, it took for my brother and my homeboys to come up in there for the other guys in the pod that didn't know me, that didn't want to have anything to do with me, that was standoffish or whatever. It took for my brother them to come in there for them to be like, oh, ping your brother such and such, man, I ain't okay with this and that. And things started opening up for me. So as, as the days went on, I started getting more comfortable, you know what I mean, with my surroundings. You know, I started seeing that I had more homeboys up there than I knew. And all of them was on that same type of time that I heard that my uncles them was on. You know, they was, carrying around knives, they was robbing people, they're doing all of this in prison. They were doing basically the same thing that I was used to on the street, what got me in there, robbing. So that's what I started doing. I fell into that crowd, started robbing people in prison, you know, guys that was going over to the visiting room, getting their little drugs or however they was getting it in through the officers or whatever. I started robbing them. And ultimately, that's what caused me to end up being stabbed, you know. Um, hmm. I rolled up one in one of the guys' cell one day. I rolled up on this white guy that I thought was a little weak white guy. But it turned out that he wasn't weak at all. You know, I rolled up on him, went into the cell, and if, when I first went in the cell, I knocked on, a, on his door. He told me to come in, and when I came in, I hit him. <sighs> hit him in his face, stunned him, and I pulled my knife out. 
And when I pulled my knife out, I made the mistake of talking to him because I don't know where he came out with it at, but he came out with a knife, you know? And the door was already shut. That's how they did it. It was ran by, uh, it was controlled, you know, let, and they shut the door when I first got up in there. So here it is. This guy was fighting for his, <laughs> you know, and I respected that, you know, but it caught me off guard. He got the first little stab in him, which hit me right over here on the side. And, um, man, that was a wake-up call for me, you know. But I think at that moment of me actually getting stabbed, you know, by somebody who I thought was a little weak white boy, you know, um, hey, man, it, it, it just it, it woke me up a little bit. I mean, I I got what I came for, you know, but I didn't get it the way uh, my homeboys thought I got it. They thought I went in there and just stabbed the dude up and took it from him, you know, so they were praising me, but I never did told no, uh, tell them, you know, I'm gonna tell you, yeah, y'all now, but I guess, uh, me and the guy in the room stabbing each other and I had him on the ground and he was like, man, if this is what you came for, man, you can get this, man. You ain't had to come in here like this. You could. So I ended up letting him up and we ended up talking. And <laughs> man, he, he, he broke me off. You know, he gave me what I came in there for. I ain't take it all, but I didn't get it the way I went in there to get it. You know, I tried to uh, just go in there and take it from him. You know, he put up so so much of a fight, man, and I, he, and I ain't gonna lie to you, I ain't want no more. <laughs> he stabbed me, I ain't, I ain't want no more. I was ready when he said, man, you can get it. I was glad that he said that, you know, I didn't, I'm bleeding, you know. But, you know, that's what uh, actually got me, you know, on that, track of robbing people in prison, you know, and it taught me a little something that I can't just pull it out and not use it. If I pull it out, I got to use it, you know. That was my mistake. I learned from it, and, you know, like I said, I'm not glorifying it, but it taught me that when I pull it out, to use it, and that's what I started doing. Whenever I pulled it out, I used it. If I wasn't going to use it, I wasn't going to pull it out. But that was just one little incident that got me, you know, on the little track of being a hard head, a knucklehead, or an asshole, or whatever you want to call it, in prison. You know, my first month in prison, I ended up getting stabbed behind trying to take a dude drugs from him. Talk to me about. Okay. Who's getting robbed? Like, what kind of individuals were you looking for? And be as candid as you as you want to be yeah. about it. You know, like I say, during that time, man, you know, the idea, the idea target, you know, in prison, you know, during the late 80s when I went, was white boys. Because uh, I don't know when, during that time, everything was, everything was sectioned off. You know, like you have today, you have the Bloods, you had the Crips, you had the GDs, you had the MS-13, you got, you know, and everybody stayed within their own group. During that time, Tidewater hung with Tidewater, Richmond hung with Richmond, D.C. hung with D.C., you know. And if I'm from Tidewater, and here it is, I'm hanging with these dudes from Richmond all the time, my homeboys from Tidewater, will have a problem with that, you know, during that time. A lot of white boys during that time, they really, you know, wasn't clicked up like that. You know, they was basically doing their own thing or whatever. It may have been one or two if they wasn't in some kind of little biker game, you know, because you had, you know, a few guys that was, uh, had a reputation of being a hell's angel or this or that. You know, but it won't many of them, you know. 
And during that time, Tide Water was the biggest thing in prison. You know, you had a lot of guys from Tide Water, in, you know, in prison, man, during that time. And when one of us went to war, all of us went to war, you know. But the thing I do like about, I did like about prison back then was that regardless of where you was from, whether it was D.C., Tide Water, Richmond, or what, or whether you was a Hills Angel or white boy, whether you was gay, homosexual, or faggot, or what, when a convict had a situation with the administration or with the police, everybody came together. I don't give a damn. This dude here just finished taking If the police was treating him wrong, everybody went the back for him. Everybody during that time, man. But, like I said, it was a click thing back then. And, um, you know, the easiest targets, man, like I said, it's sad to say it was white boys. If you want in the Aaron brother, you know what I mean, the AB or whatever you want to call it, man, if you want in that or a biker gang, whatever, you was a prime target, man. During that time, we, white boys couldn't have nothing in prison. You never really heard of a white boy running a stove box back then in prison. You never seen a white boy walking around with a gold chain around his neck, going to commissary by himself, or none of that. And man, like I say, they, they, were, they were the easiest one to rob. You know what I mean? Because the Mexicans, you know, they stuck together. They was, you know what I mean? They stuck together, even though some of them got it. But the Mexicans and, you know, the Spanish guys or whatever, man, they really won't into too much uh, drugs. You know, they really won't into that type of scene, you know. But like I said, you had, uh, you know, the white guys, most white guys up in there, their family, I guess, were taking care of them during that time, man, and they was the easiest targets, you know. Uh, but that's how uh, things were back then, you know. It's sad to say, but that's how it was, man. So I want to talk about what, if anything, would you ever reach a point during your time where you would change, where you would stop being on the the rah-rah stuff, or would you ever, did that ever come for you, or was that just the way it was always going to be because you felt like you were never getting released? I mean, well, like I say, during that time, you know, I had a parole date at that time. I was just, I guess, seeking a reputation during that time. You know, but once I finally got that reputation and living that lifestyle, it won't fun no more. Because now, you know, I'm being transferred to different prisons. My homeboys ain't coming with me now. I'm being transferred by myself. I, and I had done so much wrong to people, man, you know, that I didn't know that by the time I got on this compound here, if anybody that I stabbed or robbed or whatever did something wrong to was here. You know, because when you go into the dining hall, you knew fresh on the camp and you go into the dining hall and all these people around, you don't, you don't, you can't see everybody. So if I done done something wrong to you and you sitting up in there and you, you know, everybody see the new guys coming through the door. So if I've done something wrong to you and you got it in your mind that you're going to get me, you can actually get me because I don't know who's on this compound. I'm going into the down the hall looking around and everything, and you could be sitting right there in the corner somewhere or sitting at a table with your head down with a knife in your hand waiting for me to get in position for you to stab me. I'm going to tell you this incident. Um, <laughs> this incident, man, it really changed me. I robbed this, uh, beat this white guy down, man, on Greenville. This was in 94. And I took his uh, sack from him. He had just got a sack, you know, from the V room. And he had a gold watch on his arm. I, t I beat him down, took his gold watch, took his sack from him. He had an ounce of reefer. I took that from him. This was in 94. A couple months later, we had a little ride on Greenville uh, in September. 
September 19th. I'll never forget it. We had to ride. Me being involved in it, I got transferred over to C unit. On Greenville, you had three different units. It's like three different prisons in the one. I went from B unit to C unit. And the part that I was in, that they put me in, uh, I was in the cell next door to the same guy that I took the uh, watch and the ounce of reefer from. But I didn't know that that was him. But all I knew is that the guy that I moved in the cell with, he was like, man, you drink wine? I said, yeah. He said, this guy next door, man, um, he make wine. You know, he's selling some. So I was like, yeah, let me, um, you know, introduce me, man, let me, you know, because I wanted to take me a drink. You know, I, that was my thing. So I go to the guy's cell. He told me, come on in. He got the cell dark. The cell completely black, completely dark, man. And he walking around, he got a hat pulled over, a skull cap pulled over his head, and he got his coat on, got his shades on. I see it's a white guy, you know, tall white guy. He say, go ahead and sit on the bed, man. So I sat on the bed, you know, <laughs> I'm getting ready to get f***ed up now. It's my thing here, you know what I mean? I need me a drink. While he was over there fixing it, the, you know, what I'm thinking that he fixing the pouring the wine in the cup. And what she actually did, he turned around and gave me a, a big old cup. Let me see that cup right there. I ain't mean to say it like that, but he, he, he fixed me a cup of wine just like this. And he handed it to me. He said, here you go. He said, go ahead on buck that. <laughs> I bucked it. Get it back to him. So he said, you want to know? I said, yeah. He said, that was on the house right there. So it, I sat back and I'm like, man, shit, this, it's all right right here, man. I'm in a good part right here. I ain't thinking about nothing but getting drunk. He turned around, man, with the biggest knife I ever seen in my life. It was a big old junk, man. Nice, big, thick junk. He turned around and he said, see you, man? He said, I could have got you. He said, but I'm going to let you go. He said, I could have got you. And I, and I was, I was stunned. I was f***ed up. I'm like, what? You know, because I, he, he, he told me to buck the cup of wine, and I'm, you know, and that's, I'm feeling that a little bit, you know. And I'm like, whoa, man, what? You know, he took his shades off, took his hat off, took his coat off, and it done. I say, man, god damn. I say, B unit. He said, yeah. He said, man, I started to get you. He say, but I ain't gonna, he say, man, I ain't like that no more. You know, because this had been over a year now. You know, since last time I seen him, since that happened. He say, man, I don't live like that no more. He say, man, I'm into the word right now. He say, but I do make this wine and I sell this wine. That's how I make my hustle. You know what I mean? He say, I don't get no money from the street or none of that. He say, but man, I don't live like that no more. You know what I mean? He say, um, I'm just letting you know, man. Just let it go. You don't, you don't bother me. I ain't going to bother you. You know what I mean? Stay out my way and I'm going to stay out yours. Hey, man, I would have told him anything to get the hell out that cell right, you know, at that moment. So I said, man, you got it. You know what I mean? So he handed me the wine. I said, no, <laughs> I'm good. I don't want, you know what I mean? And right to this day, me and that white dude there is just like this. We done met up on different compounds, and I done told everybody, man. I used to tell guys about that story all the time because guys used to, being in there, that he's in the word, guys used to take him for granted. You know, the guys used to think that he was a little pushover, and I used to be like, no, not him. You know what I mean? Not that dude right there, man. Don't f*** that dude right there, man. But that's what changed me because I was like, man, it ain't no fun no more. Here it is, because now I'm starting to look over my shoulders now. So I stopped carrying around the little knives. You know, I stopped hanging around certain homeboys that just didn't, you know, that won't on that type of time no more, that won't trying to change, man. And here it is, my date is still at 2052. But, like I said, I got tired of looking over my shoulder, man. 
being in that cell right there was a wake up call to me. That guy showed me one of the biggest knives I seen in my life, man. You know, my prison life. I started getting into religion myself. You know, I started studying religion, you know, just, you know, just trying to change, man, trying to do something better with myself. It worked for a little while. I ain't gonna lie, it worked for a little while, but once you start down a path, it's hard to get off that path because people ain't gonna let you. Because I didn't change, these guys over here that I done did something wrong to, they not trying to hear that, that I done changed. Nah, it's get back time, man. You know what I mean? It's on site. Get me before I get you. Like I say, I tried to change, but you know, guys that I done wrong just won't try to hear it. So it forced me back up into that lifestyle, you know. And um, so every compound I've been on, you know, I either they had to bust somebody in the head with a lock in the sock, or I had to stab somebody. And it just won't fun no more, man. You know, it won't fun like it was in the beginning when I had all my homeboys with me. It just won't fun no more, man, when I had to stand up and do it on my own. I learned how to stand up on my own. You know, and like I say, I'm not glorifying that lifestyle, you know, because it's reckless. But at the same time, that paranoia is what got me sitting right here in front of y'all today. Me being paranoid, me watching over my shoulder. And it caused me to start making better decisions. That time and period in my life right there, man, you know, it was good in the beginning, like I said, but after a while, I uh, had to do it on my own without my homeboys and whatever. It won't no fun, man. It won't no fun. It ain't no fun being caught up in the cell Everybody going to chow, you and this guy locked up in the cell, stabbing each other. And to hear the blade hitting bone, <laughs> hey man, that shit sickening, man. It's something I don't never want to hear no more. Yeah. I don't have nothing to prove to nobody in prison. I don't have nothing to prove to nobody out here. I don't have nothing to prove to Nobody, man. I was a stand-up guy in prison, and I'm a stand-up guy now. It's just that now, man, I'm on a different path right now. I want to smile, man. I want to laugh. I want to, you know, I want to be around my family. You know, I want to, man, I want to go to work. I want to come back. I want to kiss my woman if I had one. I don't have now one right now, but if I had one, I sure would like to kiss her, you know. But I want to start enjoying life now, man, you know, on a better note, you know. I ain't trying to look over my shoulder out here. I did enough of that in prison.